Good morning. Thank you um, all for joining us today. Um, my name is Colette Ngana, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate in the Department of Sociology here at Case Western, um, and I also chair the board of directors at Preterm, which is a nonprofit abortion clinic here in Cleveland. Um, and I'm just going to be sort of guiding a conversation today with Dr. Roberts. Um, so I'm going to do a brief introduction um, and then we can kind of get started with our conversation. Um, so Dr. Roberts is the 14th Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor and George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. She also holds appointments in the departments of Africana Studies, um, Sociology and the Law School where she is the inaugural Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Mosul Alexander Professor of Civil Rights. Um, Dorothy Roberts is also the founding director of the Penn Program on Race, Science, and Society, um, an internationally recognized scholar, public intellectual, and social justice advocate. She has written and lectured extensively on race, gender, and class inequities in the United States. Institutions sorry, in the U.S. institutions and has been a leader in transforming public thinking and policy on reproductive freedom, child welfare, and bioethics. Um, Dorothy Roberts is a prolific scholar um, and is the author of Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, amongst other books. Um, she has also published more than 100 articles and book chapters, including um, an article entitled Race, which was published in the 1916 Project book. So if everyone could join me in welcoming Dr. Roberts, that would be great. Thank you. OK. Um, well, first, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing very well, thank you. It's wonderful to see you, and I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm in Cincinnati where I just gave a talk, and I couldn't get there in time, but uh, I'm glad I can join you all remotely anyway. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so I have a few questions prepared already. Um, we're sort of hoping that maybe we can have some audience participation too, if there's time that allows. Um, so I guess we can get started. Uh, in the articles and books that you've written, you've made compelling arguments for us to sort of move away from the language of reproductive choice and focus efforts instead on reproductive justice. So why is using a justice instead of a rights framework important? It's important because it's the only way to describe the oppressions that are enacted, the kind of violence that's enacted in the name of reproduction and population control, uh, the kinds of violences that people have experienced uh, targeting their reproductive lives. Uh, rooted in white supremacy and racism, classism, disability, uh, uh, bias, and uh, other kinds of societal inequities. Uh, choice doesn't, doesn't capture those, and rights don't fully capture what we need in order to have true reproductive freedom. So uh, choice in particular, which has been uh, the the predominant way of framing reproductive freedom by mainstream reproductive rights uh, organizations for a long time, also a way of framing it in uh, most jurisprudence. It, it privileges people who have the most power, the most access, who are the most valued in our society and who can make choices. Uh, rights tend to focus on protecting those choices uh, from government interference, but they don't take into account the structural factors that make it impossible for many people to make choices. And they also don't take into account 
the way in which we may need protection from the government or we may need affirmative resources provided by the government. And so uh, both because they're framed as negative rights, mostly most constitutional interpretations of rights are negative uh, and because they don't take into account the structural inequities, the power imbalances that have the most impact on our lives and produce the most inequality, uh, choice and rights are limited. I, I would say that choice is actually uh, not only unhelpful, it is uh, puts it as, us at a disadvantage because it sets up a framework where if you end up being oppressed, you end up having limitations on your freedom, on your autonomy, it, the comeback is, well, you made bad choices. It, it focuses so much on the individual as if individuals have freedom as long as the government isn't banning them from doing something, when in fact uh, there are all sorts of societal pressures. Uh, also, it doesn't take into account the devaluation of certain people's choices so that even when the government prohibits you or punishes you for making decisions, society doesn't always, the dominant society doesn't always recognize it uh, because it, uh, it doesn't value their decisions. So just to put some more, uh, and, and we can talk about this some more, but so that this, is, this doesn't sound so abstract, uh, black women's reproduction has been devalued. Uh, our autonomy over our bodies has been devalued since the time of slavery. And even after emancipation, our childbearing has been devalued. So what looks like a, a policy that is good for society, for example, the policies that regulate Black women's reproduction, many people think, oh, that's good for society. And so it doesn't even seem as if it's a reproductive violation, for example, to have welfare laws that deter people from having children. Uh, many people think that's good because they don't recognize how it's the fuel types about Black reproduction and how it has a particular impact on, on Black women's childbearing and on a choice, I think is a bad and reproductive justice isn't, we believe in the human right to have a child or not have a child, which would include the right to abortion, but as I was emphasizing, not just the right to uh, uh, not be interfered with, which is important as we can see after the Dobbs decision, uh, the importance of uh, having a constitutional right uh, to abortion, but it was never enough if you couldn't afford one. And the, and the Supreme Court held early on that uh, there was no constitutional right to public funding for abortion. So we were already, from the beginning, uh, we were already without a true right, human right, to terminate a pregnancy. But it also includes the human right to have a child and to have a child under the conditions that you want, which would include birth justice. Uh, as well as uh, the, just the, um, you know, the theoretical right to have a child. Again, you have to have the means uh, to have a child. And then also the, uh, what is often uh, neglected, the right to parent your child in a safe uh, community with the conditions that are required to be able to take care of a child, the economic, social, and political conditions, and that your children are valued by society and supported, uh, and your family is supported and not uh, not uh, experiencing devaluation and violence against it. So uh, all of these are essential to true reproductive freedom, which uh, Black women in particular have been at the forefront of advocating for, uh, really for centuries, and. Uh, I think it's wrong to think of 
our advocacy for reproductive justice as just as just being recent and and a reaction to a reproductive rights or choice framework. It's been deeply, deeply part of black feminist uh, uh, thinking and activism for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in that answer, you mentioned a few sort of policy level restrictions, right? You mentioned the, the recent ruling of Dobbs, which effectively overturned Roe v. Wade, um, leaving abortion up to the states, right? So it went back to the states' rights, which is what it was previously, as well as sort of the funding restrictions that we have through policies like the Hyde Amendment. And so I'm going to kind of ask you a question on some of your work that, you know, follows these legislative um, policies, right? So when you first wrote Killing the Black Body, it was in the wake of legislative moves sort of rooted in these systems that you were talking about, right? Racism, sexism, and classism, and the stereotypes um, that were sort of used to increase the criminal criminalization of pregnancy and limit social support services, right? So ultimately, the goal was to lower fertility, specifically among um, certain populations, um, which include black and poor people. Uh, but today, we're seeing this continued push, right, through through um, policies like Dobbs, uh, to control the and limit reproductive um, rights, so, like specifically abortion rights. So. Um, if you could speak a little bit sort of about the trajectory that you've seen in policy from when you wrote Killing the Black Body um, in the 1990s to today. It's a, it's a pretty big you know, gap of time, but you know, if you could sure. give us a little, a little glimpse. Well, you could have asked for the trajectory since 1619, <laughs> and I could have answered that as well, because I think it is interesting all of what we're talking about today, we can trace back to the uh, con uh, control of black women's reproductive labor and exploitation of black women's reproductive labor during the institution of slavery. And maybe we'll get to that as well. But starting from the, uh, ter the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, that was when I began to notice the prosecutions of uh, women for being pregnant and using drugs. And I immediately thought, I bet these are mostly black women who are being punished this way. And I thought of it as the punishment of black women for being pregnant. Uh, it, it wasn't, they weren't being punished for drug use. They were being punished for being pregnant and using drugs. Uh, and drug use was just one mechanism for punishing them for their pregnancies. And uh, I, 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 I wrote about it as the way in which race, the intersection of racism and sexism, and also the war on drugs, was a way of turning a public health issue, uh, a drug use during pregnancy, into a crime. And for the first time, uh, women were being prosecuted for their conduct during pregnancy. Uh, this the, before the 19 uh, late 1980s, there weren't prosecutions of uh, women for being pregnant and using drugs. And of course, this was all uh, fomented and fueled by the myth of the so-called crack baby who was uh, treated as if uh, they were monsters who were predicted to not be able to learn, to become criminals, to become welfare cheats, and just be a huge burden on US society uh, from the minute of birth, all of which has been discredited and was just made up uh, from the very beginning and was racist from the very beginning because these kinds of claims were never made about other babies who might have been exposed to drugs in the womb. Uh, now, uh, I was arguing then, and others in the reproductive justice movement, that we had to pay attention to the punishment of pregnant people, you know, people who w wanted to have babies, uh, and that this was connected to 
the ban and restrictions on abortion. Remember at the time, most of the reproductive rights movement was focused on legal abortion and preserving Roe v. Wade, but there initially was not uh, the same kind of outcry against these prosecutions, which were related to a long history of during the same period of the 1990s. Uh, not only was the myth of the pregnant black crack addict um, uh, being circulated, but also and the myth of the crack baby, but also the myth of the black welfare queen that black women were having babies just to get a welfare check and that they were then spending the money on themselves. Uh, so as we're seeing the rise of these prosecutions, we're also seeing the advocacy for ending welfare, the federal guarantee of welfare, uh, which had been uh, uh, just assumed for decades now there was a push to end welfare, not only to end it, but to allow states to put restrictions on welfare receipt that included what's called uh, the uh, child exclusion policies or family caps, uh, not providing additional uh, welfare benefits to people who already are on welfare when they get pregnant and have another child. So, and that was intended to deter them from having more children. So we see in the 1990s, the prosecutions, which were punishments for having children. Uh, we see end of the federal guarantee to welfare. Uh, we see the, the buildup of criminal law enforcement. The, the 1993 crime control bill was passed in the same period, again, fueled by negative images about black women having dangerous children. And I'll mention one other law because I think all of this is related and it shows the intersections of these policies uh, that have been fueled by these same negative stereotypes. And that is the 1997, uh, one year after the welfare restructuring law was passed in 1997, the Adoption and Safe Families Act, which was supposed to deal with the huge foster care population. And at the time, the largest group of children in foster care were black children. Black children were four times as likely to be taken from their families and put in foster care as white children. And the Adoption Safe Families Act sped up termination of parental rights. And these were rights perceived as black mothers' rights to their children and incentivizing states to increase the adoptions of children out of foster care instead of returning them home. To sum this up, we can see that there's this intersection of policies that, um, that are about reproductive injustice, uh, policies to criminalize uh, uh, pregnancy, policies uh, to restrict abortion, and policies to uh, change welfare into a behavior modification system and policies to increase the separation of children from their families. Uh, all of these have are reproductive injustices that uh, at, the t at the time though, the connections weren't seen. And so when we think about the fallout of the Dobbs decision, what that is gonna mean for people's health for their autonomy over their bodies, for their freedom uh, over their lives, for their uh, ability to raise their families in healthy and safe conditions. We see now more clearly than ever that all of these uh, kinds of policies that people for their reproductive decisions and uh, do not attend to the social conditions and inequitable social structures uh, are uh, have put us where we are now, where uh, although it's an extremely precarious position, at least we can now see these connections and the need to come together in the various movements that are uh, addressing them 
uh, into a stronger reproductive justice movement connected to movements for economic justice, connected to movements for environmental justice, uh, for gender justice, uh, and uh, for uh, family uh, justice, you know, uh, birth justice, that they are all connected and we, we can no longer focus just on uh, termination of pregnancy. We have to see how they're connected to these other movements as well. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think this also sort of brings up, you know, if just sort of in the recent policies that we have, right, we've we've sort of criminalized pregnancy in ways of like not being able to travel across state lines, right? Um, states have laws like that sort of associated with restricting um, the needs that people have around health care. So we can sort of see how this criminalization that you're you're referencing is building over time and becoming sort of different, right? Depending on on how these policies are written, and and you mentioned you know the the child welfare system um, as connected to to the trajectory that we're experiencing. And I was um, wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your recent work um, and how it relates to the conversation we're having today. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, my uh, latest book that was published in um, uh, April is called Torn Apart, How the Child Welfare System Destroys Black Families and How Abolition Can Build a Safer World. And it focuses on the what's called the child welfare system, foster care, child protective services. Uh, I'm calling it a, fam a family policing system because what the system does is it's based in accusing family caregivers for harming their children, uh, then investigating them, regulating their families, uh, often separating uh, them from their children, putting children in foster care, uh, then supervising them, uh, and in many cases, terminating the rights of family members to be a legal family. And uh, it is based on the idea that the harms to children are caused by their parents and other family caregivers. And the way to address the unmet needs of children is to blame their families and take children away or threaten to take them away. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key three tenets of reproductive justice is the right to parent your child and to parent your child in a community that has the resources it needs to, to meet children's needs. Uh, most of the children who are taken from their families by this system are taken on grounds of neglect. About 80% of the children taken are taken on grounds of neglect. Only about 16% are removed because of child abuse or uh, either physical or sexual child abuse. And neglect is typically conflated with poverty or confused with poverty. Uh, it simply means that the family caregivers have failed to meet the children's material needs. So not providing adequate clothing or food or housing or education or medical care. Those are all grounds or supervision, all grounds for child neglect. Uh, and uh, most of the children who are taken are come from impoverished or low income families and black children and indigenous children are disproportionately taken from their families. So about 15% of native children will be taken uh, by the time they each reach age 18, about 12% of black children will be taken by the time they reach age 18. And an astounding number of families are investigated uh, by Child Protective Services. Black children in particular, a recent study found that more than half of black children will be subject to a child welfare investigation by the time they reach age 18. Uh, it, their deep roots in the system targeting the most marginalized communities, again, Black and 
Native or Indigenous communities have been the main targets. Uh, recently, uh, for a long time, Black children were simply ignored by the child welfare system. But when Black families began to enter the welfare and child welfare systems, uh, we see that the system became more punitive. Both welfare and child welfare became more punitive. And uh, this is where we get this mushrooming of the foster care population with federal policy and state policy turning to family separation as the main way that it met the unmet needs of Black children. Of course, totally inadequately because we have a huge uh, child poverty rate in the United States and we know that there are many, many children whose needs aren't met. But what this system does is pretend it's meeting those needs by putting children in foster care and regulating and policing families when in fact this is a way of obscuring the need for radical social change and reimagining what we think of as child safety. Uh, and let me just add that there are really deep entanglements between the family policing system and the criminal legal system, uh, both practically in the way that they set up joint task forces, uh, caseworkers uh, often go with police officers to search homes and investigate families and take children away, uh, but also the logic, the carceral logic of punishing people uh, is present both in the prison system, the uh, criminal legal system, and the family policing system. And then finally, I would say that, uh, and I hope we can talk about, I'll wait for your next question to see if you want to talk about how we abolish these systems, because I want to talk about that as well. But let me also mention that the foster care system, so-called foster care system, which is really a foster industrial complex. It's a multi-billion dollar system that uh, maintains children away from their families with, by the way, those people who maintain the children away from their families get more benefits than the struggling families themselves. And uh, it is a system that has been shown through multiple, multiple studies to be extremely harmful to children, not only the abuse that many suffer within it, but also the outcomes are really dismal uh, with children in foster care, less likely to uh, graduate from high school, go to college, more likely to be houseless, have lower incomes, more likely to be incarcerated or put in juvenile detention, uh, suffering from PTSD uh, and uh, a host of other kinds of harms that come from being taken from your family, that trauma, but also put into a system that moves children from place to place, puts far too many in institutions instead of in uh, foster homes, and uh, is very disruptive of children's lives. Um, thank you for, I'm sure that this was, you know, like the prolific amount of work that you've done sort of boiled down into a few minutes. Um, yes. when you, <laughs> when you mentioned talking more about abolition, I saw like a lot of heads nodding in the crowd. So, um, let's talk about that. Right. So a part of addressing these, these systems is, is pushing against them. Sort of how do we contest right? The, the foster industrial complex you're talking about, the family policing system. Um, so are there any sort of movements or actions um, rooted in abolition that you um, are seeing happening today uh, that support this reproductive justice movement? Yes. So, uh, so I can talk about uh, some recent developments in the abolishing the family policing system, uh, as well as ways in which reproductive justice activists are recognizing ties between uh, their movement and the movement to abolish the prison industrial complex, and also an abolitionist 
approach to ending the injustices that we see uh, in, uh, in with regard to reproduction in particular. So, um, so let me first just say why reproductive justice should be an abolitionist uh, movement. Uh, the the when you when you're dealing with a system or a set of institutions and policies that are rooted in uh, in in false and uh, white supremacist, sexist, uh, heterosexist, uh, ableist, you know, um, capitalist ideologies, and that are designed to control people, uh, that are designed to obscure the need for social change, you cannot just fix these systems. Uh, the prison industrial complex, the system of family policing, for example, cannot be fixed because they were grounded in and have continued to support a racial capitalist system to support white supremacy, to support structures of political inequality, you know, hierarchies of social and political and economic injustice. And so uh, they have to be abolished, which means reimagining how we, you know, reimagining the society we want uh, and reimagining how people's needs should be met, how violence should be addressed in our society and prevented, uh, how social conflict should be grappled with in ways that are caring, that support human flourishing and no longer reinforce the unequal structures that still govern our society. And so uh, at, at the same time, at the same time that we're dismantling the unjust systems, we have to be creating, building the ways of relating to each other and meeting our needs that we want. And so that overall is the approach that is required for reproductive justice. Uh, it's required for the prison industrial complex and it's required for family policing. So the family policing system, for example, is rooted in the ideology that impoverished families and families that are living under racist conditions, you know, that their children are disadvantaged because of pathologies that their parents have. And that the way then to address the children's disadvantages and unmet needs is to take them away from their families and put them into state custody. If that's what the family pol policing system is grounded in, there's, it doesn't exist if it doesn't have that grounding. And, and, and even when it tries to reform, it still is grounded in that idea. There's, I haven't heard of any reforms within the so-called child welfare system that don't have as the, at the bottom the threat of taking your children away from you. You know, it relies on that. And also, I've never heard of any reforms that say, well, we're going to treat wealthy white families the same as impoverished black or indigenous or impoverished white families. It, it's still targeted at the most marginalized communities. So we're building a better way, a more humane and caring non-punitive, non-coercive way of actually supporting families and meeting children's needs. Uh, another a thing I want to emphasize about an abolitionist approach is that you begin to realize 
that abolitionist movements, uh, including the unfinished movement of abolition of slavery in America, which requires a truly just and democratic society, which we haven't achieved yet, but uh, the, the movement to abolish family policing, to abolish the prison industrial complex, that those movements are moving toward a very common vision of a just and humane and caring society. And that it makes sense then for us to come together uh, to share strategies, to share activism, uh, to share support for each other. Uh, and, and that's, I think, one of the most exciting aspects of an abolitionist framework and activism is that you see more clearly not only the connections among the violent and harmful systems, but also the connections among our visions for a better society and therefore the, the opportunity to work together to create that society. Uh, thank you for that, like pretty uh, robust explanation of of abolition. And um, I think so. I think I'm going to skip one of the questions I have. And as you're talking about sort of how abolition can bring people together, right? How we can work as a community towards something that is healthier and better for all of us. Um, I'm wondering what sort of advice you have for people wanting to join these efforts, right? Wanting to join reproductive justice movements because the the topics that we're discussing right now and the idea of having to abolish and rebuild systems that are so, you know, deeply rooted and honestly successful in the way that they were designed can be very overwhelming to think about, right? So I always like to kind of think about what, what can we do, you know, ourselves here and now where we are to kind of make it feel a little bit more achievable for those of us and, and anybody sort of watching to to make sort of incremental change to, to support reproductive justice. So to kind of repeat the question, um, what mm -hmm. advice do you have for people wanting to support these movements or join them? Yeah, so uh, so first I would say, well, let me first respond to what you were saying about being overwhelming. And uh, I think it does seem very overwhelming. Of, uh, of course, we're trying to change, you know, 400 years of ideology and, and uh, foundational ways of living and uh, valuing people that are so, so deeply embedded uh, that this this morning I was giving a talk about racism in medicine and the way in which ideas about black bodily difference and even just the the notion that race is a a natural division of human beings that produces you know different uh, groups of people who have innate uh, biological difference which is the explanation for health and other inequities that that idea has been circulating for uh, eh, 400, 500 years and is still present and is so powerful. How it, It's not just about changing institutions and systems, it's also about changing foundational ways of thinking. And boy, race is so foundational to, to all of the, what we've been talking about. And so, you know, these ideas are so widely held. So, and then there's uh, a movement to, uh, you know, backlash movement against us to say, you can't even teach about this. <laughs> you know, it, it, uh, it's a crime for, for professors to teach the, the, the truth about these ideas. So, uh, yes, it's, I, I'm only, elaborating your question, Galetta, how really it's even worse than what you described. But, um, but number one, I think recognizing that these are not innate traits that people have, even racism is not an innate trait. You know, recognizing that these structures were built 
they were these ideas were invented. Uh, it means that we can invent something else. It means that they can be dismantled. Just I think knowing the history and the the way in which white supremacy and patriarchy and you know classism, et cetera, have been built on each other from fundamental foundations also gives us the ability to think about how we can unbuild them, how we can dismantle them, how we can build based on a different ideology and way of thinking. So just, uh, you know, sort of, um, I guess, foundationally thinking about it, I think it's important to recognize that injustice is not natural. It's it's the the view of the oppressor that oppression is natural, that the disadvantages that oppressed people encounter and resist, that they're natural. That's the oppressor's view. That's the view of the powerful to try to get us to believe that the injustice and the inequality in our society is natural. So once we recognize it's not natural, then that opens up the, the, the possibility, the real possibility that we can change it. Uh, and then we can also look at the long history of resistance. For every unjust way of thinking, there's always been resistance against it. From the very beginning of the invention of race, there have been people who've said, no, God did not you know, create the races. Uh, uh, no, nature did not divide us into races. Uh, there's been resistance by people who are enslaved, despite everything against them, they have resisted and succeeded in rebellions. Yes, many rebellions were snuffed out, but there were those that succeeded. So we have a long legacy of resistance and victories from it. So that's just to let people know that we can we can change the society. We can abolish these institutions and systems. But of course, you use the word incremental. I think I use that as well. It's not going to happen overnight. We do have to strategize about the incremental changes. Uh, as Ruth Gilmore says, the non-reformist reforms, the abolitionist reforms that we have to engage in as we work toward the common vision we have of a society that's more humane and equal and caring. And then the question is, what can I do to contribute to the strategizing and the implementation of those incremental steps? Now, you have to do it with other people. You can't just think about it. You, know, you can't just, I mean, it is good to donate money, but even then you should donate it to people who are doing the work. So you have to learn, after you learn about what abolition means, if you're not clear on what it means, then find abolitionist organizations to work with. Uh, you, this has to be a collective effort because you can't figure out what abolition requires in your head by yourself. Uh, if we're trying to change, radically change hundreds of years of injustice and the kinds of ideas that that has built and the structures that that has built, then it's gonna take work to know how to do it. It takes work to strategize. There's so many questions that are unanswered uh, that you can't turn to a book to that I'll never be able to answer. Uh, and even people who have been doing this longer than I have and are smarter than me can't answer it by themselves. We have to strategize and 
work together. And so the the first thing, again, after learning about abolition and, and being committed to it, is finding an organization of activists who are doing the work that you're interested in and seeing how you can contribute to it. Yeah, I think that that's a great um, sort of reminder for us, especially those of us who spend so much time in the academy, right, that we do a lot of reading and thinking and, and producing of of knowledge, right? But sometimes it doesn't always translate into the action piece, right? So sort of remembering, and I think that this event does that really well. Um, later in the event, we're gonna have more information on sort of how can we be a part of these movements. We have activist organizations like Sister Song um, supporting this event. So um, figuring out ways that we can sort of marry these two parts of, of a lot of who we are, the people sitting in this room as students and you know staff and faculty to, to read and think, but also sort of work with people who are on the front lines doing this work as well um, is a really great reminder. But I wanted to be aware of the time. Um, part of me wants to tempt fate and ask you to put your, <laughs> your uh, video back on, but I'm not sure if that's gonna be a good idea. Um, but are, are we gonna do some questions? Okay, so there are a couple people in the audience who have questions. Um, so I will let the microphone go around and... Go ahead and tell her to try the video. Okay, yeah, Dr. Roberts, did you wanna try? try your video? Okay, I'll try and I can, I'll turn it off if, if uh, it messes things up. Can I also just add one thing to what you just said, Colette? Yes. Which is not only will what we not be able to put our recommendations into action, but our recommendations could be wrong. You know, I, we, again, we just because you have training in some field uh, and you're really smart doesn't mean you are going to know what is best for the people whom you are trying to serve and whose life you're trying to improve. They know a lot more than you do. And so I think that I know in my own experiences, it's I, I, I wouldn't dare to write anything or recommend anything without working with people uh, in the communities I want to serve and with people who are doing grassroots work and know better than I do what the issues are, what the problems are, what's of uh, oppressing people in their communities and what are the best ways to address them and working together uh, to figure out what those recommendations should be. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it over to audience questions. Over here. Uh, good afternoon, thank you for uh, this uh, um, eye-opening presentation. I think that uh, going along with what you're saying for next steps for any, any of us that want to work together with the community to, um, to make systems much more humane is a, a need to be able to tolerate m the mistakes that we're going to make along the way. So to tolerate each other, try to move along despite differences. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes even language can, can move people you know, to not be open to others. And so if you could talk a little bit more about that, uh, that would be good. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I think that's important as well. So uh, I think we're talking about two related aspects of doing this work. One is the importance of understanding that you could make a mistake and that therefore you want to get as much input and engagement as you can with the people whose lives you're going to impact by your work. And uh, so it's both because you, uh, to make your work effective, you want to work with people who are uh, doing 
activism, but also the people whose lives will be impacted by it. And that, you know, you have to recognize I, I might make a mistake if I don't do that. But as you're raising, uh, that doesn't mean that we should be willing to jump on people who do make mistakes. Uh, I, I think recognizing that, you know, having the humility to recognize that we are moving in, you know, although there's long legacies of resistance, we're moving in unchartered territory. Uh, even right now, after the Dobbs decision, the 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 landscape we're working in, the political landscape we're working is different than it was prior to Roe. So it's not just like we're going back to that. They're, the politics are different. Uh, as I was uh, engaging with Colette, we've we've now moved into an era where criminalization of pregnancy is more evident than it was prior to Roe. Uh, I mean, it, it, it didn't even exist really the way it does now prior to Roe. So what does, what does abolition mean in 2022? What, what do those incremental reforms mean? What is an abolitionist reform and what's a reformist reform? I think we have to have some humility that we don't know the answers and we have to work collectively to figure out those answers. But in order to do that, we all have to be gracious. Uh, and I'm not saying we should be, um, you know, tolerant of people who are out to commit oppression. You know, I, I, and it also doesn't mean we have to be so nice that we don't want to hold people accountable. It's not that. Uh, I, I took your question to be related to people who are working together on a common mission for social change. And we may have disagreements about how to do that. Uh, there are, I, I, I've encountered a lot of disagreements among people who want to abolish the prison industrial complex, for example, or abolish the family policing system, and exactly what, how much can we and how can we engage, for example, with the department. People say, can't do it at all. They say the social, no social worker should work with anything having to do with a child protection agency or with a child welfare department. Other people say, well, we can under certain circumstances, you know, and other people say, well, you've, you've got to have someone in there who can make change. Okay, so these are all questions that come up from people who genuinely want to abolish these systems. And if we, if we become unforgiving and lack humility about it, uh, we won't be able to have these collective efforts. So uh, it's a, it's, it's a, I think it's one of those, um, one of those complex aspects of any kind of work that is seeking genuinely to make a real impact. I think we okay. have reached our time for today, unfortunately. So can we have a round of applause for both of our speakers? <laughs> We're grateful for the time and your information. And we invite our guests to please continue on learning with the Walking Narrative exhibit next door, the Take Action Room, and get a t-shirt, a sticker, or a book. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.